Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on decarbonization of transport, focusing on light duty vehicles. The webinar is organized by the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, together with the Research Centers of Environmentally Friendly Energy, FME Moses and FME Entrans. So FME Moses is a research center focusing on hydrogen and batteries and, and zero emission mobility, while FME Entrans is focusing on energy transition strategies. So my name is Oscar Thomas Gard, and I am the director of the Entrance Research Center. So this topic of today's webinar is an important one for Norway and for Europe. I think if you look at the ambition of Europe to be a net zero society in 2050, there will be dramatic changes to transport in the next 30 years. Also, if you look at the particular Norwegian situation, we have ambitions to reduce uh, emissions uh, by uh, 50 to 55 percent before 2030 and we are obliged through the agreements we have with the European Commission, European Union to, to reduce them by at least 40 percent but the ambition is, is increasing and it's so that transport will have to take a, a, a large part of emission reductions in the non-quota sectors. So, if you take as a starting point that in Norway, for the next 10 years, we're going to reduce emissions by maybe 50% in transport. This gives sort of an introduction to the challenges that we're going to discuss um, uh, to, today. And uh, we will have uh, speakers coming in with a global perspective. We will have an overview of the report on decarbonizing transport made by the European Academies of Science Advisory Council. And we will have some uh, Norwegian perspectives addressing directly this challenge on how to reduce emissions by maybe even more than 50% in transport before 2030. And, and of course, when we talk about decarbonizing transport, electrification will play a role through battery electric vehicles, through hydrogen. Uh, and, and to some degree, it has been criticized as the, the electricity sector in Europe is still not decarbonized. But if you look at uh, the links between electricity and transport, there is one major point to remember. It's that the electric, uh, electricity sector in Europe, the power sector in Europe, is part of uh, the EU emission trading system. So there's a cap to emissions in this area. While transport is outside this uh, emission trading system, so every reduction that happens in, in emissions in transport will be beneficial for society, as long as they don't increase emissions other places in the system and, and of course by electrification this will not happen exactly due to the to the cap. So one could imagine that uh, then the problem is solved, we electrify transport and Norway will be happy limiting our obligations in 2030. I think if you look at uh, I think if you look at this from a practical perspective, uh, this is 10 years. There will still be a lot of combustion engines around. Uh, in, in 2030. And, and this is maybe the key of today's discussions is how this technology mix between electricity, hydrogen, biofuels, and, and maybe fossil fuels uh, will be able to meet our obligations in, in the light duty vehicle sector over the next 10 years. Will it be sustainable? Will it be feasible? What kind of policy support will be needed? And we have a number of excellent speakers to give short introductions to that and, and hopefully we will also have good questions and discussion on, on these uh, aspects. Uh, in order to moderate today's um, webinar, I will turn the word over to Marina Tofting, who is Head of Communications in the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters. So please, Marina. Thanks very much, Professor Asker Thomasgar. Uh, Asker Thomasgar is also a member of the Science Advice Committee in the Academy. Again, welcome to this webinar. My, may, my name is Marina Tofting. And after each 10 minute talk, we will open for questions. Please use the icon for Q&A to write a question, not a chat function. And I will convey the questions to the speakers. And as you might have noticed, we are recording uh, this today and, may, and will make it available on YouTube after. And we plan to finish at 11.20 today. This is a part of the science advice from the Academy who aims to give knowledge-based advice for policymakers. 
Our first speaker today is Principal Scientist at Institute for Energy Technology and Associate Professor Einstein Ulleberg. He is also a member of the ESAC Working Group on Decarbonization of Transport. Ulleberg will give a Norwegian perspective on zero emission transport technologies. Please. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, Yes, that's correct. I was uh, part of this uh, report by uh, ESAC uh, that was concluded March last year. And I would like to give you some insight to um, this report. Uh, very briefly then, uh, I will also go into the situation in Norway. You know, we are part of the EU uh, in terms of transport and energy system and uh, touch on this topic of uh, sector coupling. Uh, just, just first give credits to the chairperson, uh, Professor Bulechos uh, from ETH in Zurich uh, and uh, Secretary uh, William Gillet, uh, the director of this program. And of course, uh, co-authors and also reviewers uh, of, of the report. Uh, four main themes. The first one um, that was touched upon, uh, taking a broad perspective on this topic of decarbonization of transport, um, was that um, avoiding um, and containing the transport demand, demand for motorized transport is of course um, a, a key issue. That involves everything from promoting cycling and walking, uh, facilitating working from home, which we have experienced extensively the last six months, um, and urban and spatial planning, and then the use of ICT technology. And one topic here that was discussed uh, quite extensively was the use of, of ICT in connection with autonomous driving. Uh, it was pointed out in the report that this uh, can potentially uh, lower the cost of, of transport, but then at the same time increase the demand. So in a way, uh, contradicting what we want to achieve. Um, the second uh, main topic is uh, shifting, shifting the transport demand to more efficient modes. And that is of course going from more personal vehicles to more public transport and increasing then the capacity of that uh, public transport. Um, and then uh, pool and car sharing um, is also pointed out and shifting the freight from, from road to rail. Uh, or possibly waterways. Um, also the use of high-speed trains was discussed. One uh, special note here is that the shift will require significant infrastructure uh, investments um, in these sectors and so it's uh, a long-term effort. Then of course we need to uh, improve the technology. We typically talk mainly about this um, and so the, some key issues for the policy options that needs to be in place for, to make this transition possible over the next 10, 15 years seen from a technology point of view is of course to continue with the quite rigorous regulation on reducing the greenhouse, oh sorry, the emissions on the vehicles, grams of CO2 per kilometer. This is very forceful instrument to make the automotive um, manufacturers go towards uh, low and zero emission vehicles. And of course, other tax, uh, taxation and incentives. Low carbon fuels was also discussed, including biofuels. Then uh, uh, a real policy uh, needs to be put on uh, really converting to non-fossil fuels. Um, and that of course, cannot be seen isolated for the transport sector. It must be seen in totality with what's going on in the industry and the building sector. Uh, the specific technologies that we looked at and gave advice on uh, was the battery electric vehicles, the plug-in hybrids, and um, also potentially the fuels for electric vehicles. Also electric road systems were, were looked into. And uh, synthetic fuels has been discussed in other ESAC reports, so that was just touched upon briefly, but there is also a chapter on this. Uh, so what is the challenge? So we, as Askai pointed out, are 
quite successful in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions in the stationary sector. Um, but in the transport sector, uh, we have seen over time since 1990 that this is a significant increase in the transport demand. This goes specifically for passenger cars, the light duty vehicles, but also for buses and the heavy duty vehicles, indicated there in the gray and the, and the orange. And this increase is coming then both in passenger transport, 40% increase is expected going from 2010 to 2050. This is sort of the paths that uh, are expected. Um, and um, also on freight, a 50% increase is expected. So this is a little bit contradictory to what's uh, <laughs> one of the um, stated goals of curbing um, the demand, uh, at least in Norway. So take the Norwegian perspective, we have similar emissions from transport. We have a slightly different energy mix because of our hydroelectric power. Um, but as you can see, we still sort of emit about 30% uh, from transport sector. Uh, we have uh, um, somewhat more clear goals on what we want to do in Norway on uh, going to zero emission. By 2025, new, new car sales on the light duty vehicles and trucks, uh, the goal is to go 100% actually on, on the new car sales or vehicle sales. 2030 uh, on the heavy, heavier, medium heavy trucks and 50% on the heavy duty trucks. So that's the perspective seen from a Norwegian point of view. And what's going on on the ground is that people are buying these, um, about 50 types of battery electric vehicles uh, now on the roads. We have quite some experience starting from 2010, especially the last five years, significant increase. And there are many more on the way. And we're moving into new market like the heaviest uh, SUVs and the vans and the buses. Uh, the latest stats from 2019, it's about 9% battery electric vehicles in Norway. That's all fine, but one challenge is that um, if you, I just took some data and looked at uh, how many vehicles there are per charging point, public charging point. And as you can see here, it goes from two vehicles per charging point in 2011 to 12 in 2015 to 18. So this is an increasing challenge as we continue our development and our rollout of battery electric vehicles. So the main challenge is not just for Norway, of course, it's for Europe, that is uh, building up this infrastructure. And if you do back of the envelope calculation, you will quickly see that 250 million passenger cars in Europe, that's about what we have on the light duty side. Uh, that would, um, uh, nameplate uh, would be then uh, about one terawatt hours of installed uh, charging capacity in Europe. And then put that in context, that's about sort of what we have installed today. Obviously the average power draw will be much, much smaller about one, one third, uh, sorry, divide that by 35, you get the sort of average power draw from a slow charging point. But, but it just puts things into context that we're talking a significant increase in infrastructure build up. That's why we need to do uh, some thinking on the sector coupling. And this is a slide taken from Biasak that was discussed. And um, as you can see, uh, there's a significant focus then on going straight from electricity to battery electric, but also going the route through hydrogen, through water electrolysis is an alternative. And if you use then the biofuels, the natural gas or the carbon based fuels, you need to capture the CO2 have systems in place. To take the Norwegian perspective on that, uh, we have uh, about 140 terawatt hours per year in renewable power production, more or less and about tenfold more or less uh, on our natural gas production, which of course part of that could go towards the different sectors if you capture the CO2. Well, we must be very careful uh, when we do this electrification uh, and that has to do with, of course, not just efficiency, but cost. But when, when this slide is on, on the somewhat uh, related to each other, of course, um, but um, so the idea then is that you use battery electric vehicles that are high, high, very efficient on the lighter um, types of vehicles. And then you consider them the fuel cell vehicles with lower efficiency for the heavy duty and the long range vehicles. Moses was mentioned in the introduction and uh, we then 
uh, work on uh, heavy duty applications with battery electric and fuel cell electric uh, propulsion systems. But we also look at the whole system, how to tie things together, both the energy system and the transport system. Just a quick summary then. Uh, so yeah, so conclusions here that, that you can read up on the report yourselves if you're interested. Uh, been uh, digging into the themes of avoiding and shifting demands. How, how can you reduce and shift the transport demands, improve technology, what are the options? And how can you go about substituting the fuel from today's fuel to future fuels, for instance, such as hydrogen. There is a, an expected increase in transport demand, so the problem won't go away. Um, in Norway, we have seen a strong market growth um, for battery electric vehicles, but also we will experience challenges going forward as uh, the infrastructure will be more and more pressured, especially the um, fast charging infrastructure requirements. Um, we see also the upcoming of more uh, heavier vehicles, uh, and we see clear ambitions. Uh, so it remains to be seen then, then if these ambitions can be met. The common challenge we have with Europe is that we need to be careful in our design, our overall design of the energy and, and transport infrastructure. That was very briefly from my side. Thank you so much for listening and I can take questions now if I have time. Thank you so much, um, Ulleberg. And please send your questions using the Q&A button. It's usually on the top of your screen or maybe on the button, on the bottom of your screen. Um, while I'm waiting for the first question, Ulleberg, um, let me ask you, 2025 is coming very soon. And since you were a member of the ESAC working group, if you should pick one recommendation for the Norwegian policymakers, which one would you pick as most efficient? Is it infrastructure? Um, for 2025, um, it seems like the market, according to the prognosis from the ASAC report on prognosis on cost of the battery electric vehicles, they will be coming down to, to parity quite soon, also on the European level. So I believe uh, it's to continue with the incentives uh, for, uh, for a few more years. And then of course, also to build out infrastructure so you can have a, a wider infrastructure. I would also say that we should maybe start to think about combining the, um, the battery charging infrastructure with possibly uh, other, like more energy stations, typically like uh, hydrogen. Uh, so to start to have a more holistic approach. I got a question here. How is the situation with electric cars in Norway versus in the EU? EU? Can you compare, compare us? Uh, I think the total numbers are increasing significantly now in countries like Germany. So, uh, so the to absolute numbers are, are rapidly increasing in Europe. So we'll be possibly bypassed quite soon. Uh, with the rollout now of mass produced uh, battery electric vehicles. But for the time being, we have the highest fraction of battery electric vehicles. So in a way, and we have this 10 year experience. So, so uh, we are probably a little bit ahead of the pack. And also we uh, are now starting to look into battery recycling because our first battery electric vehicle batteries will have to go out of the system quite soon already. So we are a little bit ahead of Europe. So we, in a way we are guinea pigs for Europe. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Ulleberg. The next speaker today is senior researcher at Institute of Transport Economics in Norway, also called TUI, Lasse Fristam. Please go ahead. Well, uh, these are the four parts of my uh, talk. Uh, a little bit at first about structuring the problem, overlapping a bit with uh, what uh, uh, Einstein Ulleberg just said. And I go on to uh, say a few words about the car passenger market in Norway, the incentives they use, and then conclude. Now, I think it's useful to structure the problem by uh, uh, decomposing the total road emissions into, four, into five factors uh, like this. Uh, and then we can uh, evaluate each factor and the feasibility of doing something to it. Now, the first one here is reducing the standard of living 
or the income deliberately, which is an extremely costly strategy and one that no politician would be reelected for. Uh, secondly, we could reduce the mobility of people and goods, in other words, the, uh, the international trade and the number of, uh, of travel, uh, which uh, in the present situation actually has happened due to the corona uh, pandemic, but as a deliberate action, this too <clears throat> is not really uh, politically very feasible. So uh, the potential here is limited. Uh, and the same applies actually to the mode shift strategy, which has been the official policy of the European Union now for three decades, and nothing much has happened. The road share, uh, um, the road transport share is practically constant. Same applies actually in Norway. Now, the fourth strategy is much more promising. Uh, because uh, here we have a win-win situation in that by improving the energy efficiency of vehicles, we uh, also save costs. And if in addition we are able to, um, uh, to uh, uh, reduce the carbon content of the energy carrier, uh, we are uh, able to do uh, big improvements and both of these actually uh, occur when we electrify the vehicle fleet. So in summary, the further to the right, the more feasible the uh, policy and this is actually why this webinar makes sense, focusing on the technology innovation on the road sector. Now here say uh, a picture of the Norwegian uh, uh, success stories, so to speak. Uh, uh, the last uh, year here is 2018, where uh, the plug-in, the share of plug-in uh, new passenger cars was about 55% in uh, 2020 up, up until end of August, almost 69% of all new passenger cars sold in Norway were plug-in vehicles, battery or plug-in hybrid vehicles, and uh, the, the uh, battery electric vehicle share is just about 50% now. Uh, as for uh, other vehicles than passenger cars, the picture is much less promising. Uh, for light commercial vehicles, the BEV or battery electric vehicle share uh, this year is only 6% so far. And for heavy duty freight vehicles, in terms of percentage, the uh, zero emission share is almost negligible although a few battery electric vehicles are being put to use now, for instance, in, for instance, in renovation. So the question arises, um, should we use carrot or stick? Now, uh, you may all be familiar with the popular cat on nine tails, a very popular instrument in the 19th century and before. Uh, and today, um, the, 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 the modern version of this in Norway is um, a fiscal system with nine components, five of which, of, uh, five of which are uh, exempted for battery electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles, including uh, hydrogen vehicles. And the remaining four um, were uh, here the Battery electric vehicles are, tot are not totally exempt, but they have reduced rates. The most important one, or the two most important ones, I would say, is the exemption from the value added tax on, on the bottom here and the one of purchase tax or registration tax on top, which looks like this. It has three components. There is a CO2 component, the blue line. There is a curb weight component, the red line. And there is a small NOx component. Now, you notice that the CO2 component is negative below 70 grams of CO2 per kilometer. Uh, so it gets deducted from the sum of the weight component and the NOx component. Although, if this deduction shows a negative number, the tax is zero. There 
there's no bonus on buying electric vehicles in Norway, like for instance in France or in Sweden or in Germany. Now for battery, now for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, so certain special rules apply so that for uh, plug-in hybrids with an electric range of at least 50 kilometers, this red curve is moved to the right about 30%. So there is a certain um, incentive to buy plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, but the incentive to buy battery electric vehicles is much stronger in that they are totally exempt of the whole tax as well as all the value added tax. Now, there is a popular uh, um, idea that the Norwegian success story, to say, put it that way, is due to subsidization. Now, this is totally wrong. It is due to the opposite of subsidization, which is taxation. And uh, the leftmost bar here shows, uh, as of 17, more or less the value of the tax reliefs for battery electric vehicles, the most important of which, as you can see, is the uh, value added tax exemption. And the second most important is the avoidance of fuel tax. And the third is the uh, avoidance of registration tax. Now, there are a few local incentives to uh, at work, such as uh, zero emission vehicles having access to the bus lane in most cases and the free and designated parking for battery and uh, hydrogen electric vehicles. The subsidies are so small, they are the, just the, 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 the rightmost bar here and they consist in the government charging, no, uh, to, uh, footing the bill at uh, public parking laws also for recharging and the small money in support of hydrogen refueling and charging stations. This is as of 2017 and applies to passenger cars only. Um, it so happens now that um, although there are no subsidies for passenger, passenger cars in Norway, there are in many other countries with the effect that a lot of battery electric vehicles are imported secondhand to Norway after the first owner has cashed in the subsidy in, for instance, Germany or Sweden or South Korea or even Romania. Uh, and this has come to the attention now of Swedish politicians uh, who are now trying to change the rules for the, um, uh, the bonus. So, so, uh, so as to stop this export of Swedish subsidies to Norway. Now, um, since 2017, a few more subsidy schemes has, have been introduced, not for passenger cars, but for light commercial vehicles. There is, for instance, an extraordinary scrappage premium uh, for people uh, or companies um, scrapping their uh, internal combustion engine vehicle and buying a, a battery electric vehicle, a battery electric van instead. And there is a general subsidy for light commercial vehicles up to 50,000 Norwegian krona, that's about 5,000 euros. And there's also a general scheme for companies that want to, that uh, attempt to say uh, to save at least 10,000 liters of diesel by converting to battery electric uh, technology or biogas technology. Um, if we sum together uh, the implicit carbon price of all the Norwegian incentives for passenger cars, we get something like a thousand euros in total when we count together the fuel tax, the CO2 component of the registration tax and the weight component and the value added tax exemption and so on. All of these taxes are differentiated by CO2 emission or between battery electric and internal combustion engine vehicles. For uh, light commercial vehicles, the sum comes out at at least 3,500 kroner or 350 euros and for heavy duty vehicles, 
it's just the fuel tax that counts actually for with about 200 euros per um, per ton of CO2. So uh, uh, my, the main message here is that Norway taxes CO2 emissions in transport several times higher than the current carbon price in, uh, for instance, the United Nations uh, uh, climate panel, or in not to speak of the price in the uh, emissions trading system of the European Union. Now, uh, there are uh, perhaps a, a certain amount of instruments that have not been fully put to use yet, such as increasing the registration tax for light commercial vehicles. It is now just about 25% of the tax applicable to passenger cars. One could imagine very favorable depreciation rules for, uh, for zero emission vehicles, uh, commercial zero emission vehicles. One could imagine the full toll exemptions for light and heavy duty uh, vans and trucks. One could imagine uh, extended investment support, um, uh, in other words, extending the present subsidies for commercial vehicles, the public procurement favorite, favoring zero emission vehicles, generalized marginal cost pricing, for instance, based on GPS satellite uh, surveillance, but with exemptions for zero emission vehicles. And uh, one could uh, imagine more, mm. Uh, more money, more government money into fast charging and hydrogen refueling infrastructure, because here we have a chicken and egg problem. Nobody wants to buy a hydrogen electric vehicle as long as there is no uh, refueling infrastructure, and nobody wants to invest in refueling infrastructure when there are no vehicles, uh, no clients, so to speak, on the road. So here maybe the only solution is government support, at least in the introduction phase. Conclusions, uh, Norway has a record fast market uptake of zero emission passenger cars, brought about not by subsidization, but by stiff taxation. The subsidies are in fact very few and very small, and for passenger cars, they are almost non-existent. For commercial vehicles, a few subsidies are in force, but uh, one must be aware that uh, subsidies can be exported to other countries and also that the market depends the market uptake of zero emission technology depends on two conditions that need to be present at the same time the government incentives and the uh, technology must be present in the market so to even more briefly sum up and answer the, the three questions, the two questions in the in this webinar invitation. When should we penalize pollution? Always. When should we subsidize transition? Well, when the sticks or the uh, positive incentives are impossible or practical, but be careful so that these subsidies, subsidies are not exported. In fact, sticks work better than the carrots, and the Norwegian experience is that sufficiently painful sticks make carrots almost redundant. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lasse Fridsam. Um, I'm afraid uh, all our time is up and I have to move to the next speaker. And if you have any questions to Lasse Fridsam, we can take them at the end uh, when we have the um, um, summer up and then we will have time. Please uh, convey your um, questions on the Q&A button. So, our next speaker is Professor Folke Kray at uh, NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and Deputy Program Director at International Institute for Applied System Analysis. Please, Folke Kray. So thank you very much. Uh, let me briefly share the presentation. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, I will um, 
over the next few minutes talk a, uh, take a slightly different perspective, focus on the uh, global level challenge and um, specifically on uh, a, taking a cross-sectoral perspective on the decarbonization of transport. So um, comparing um, the speed of decarbonization uh, in the transport sector that we may need to see uh, compared to other sectors, as well as um, competition for scarce resources or for transport carbon decarbonization, uh, as well as other sectors. Many, if not all of you have probably seen uh, this picture, which shows uh, greenhouse gas emission in one and a half and two degree pathways as published in the IPCC's um, special report on global warming of one and a half degrees, um, which kind of uh, at a very high level illustrates the challenge we are facing with rapid um, reduction of, uh, of uh, all sorts of greenhouse gas emissions over the next, over the next few decades. And um, what I will show now is basically a reanalysis of um, the pathways um, underlying the IPCC report to, to break this down to the sectoral level and then um, look uh, specifically at, uh, at the transport sector. So what you see here is um, how CO2 and uh, in aggregate non-CO2 emissions under two degrees pathways and assessed in this IPCC report uh, would need to evolve uh, over uh, across uh, six different sectors, including obviously also um, the transport sector. Um, over the next uh, few decades or so. Um, one high level, uh, one high level thing that I, hang on. Okay, F uh, first of all, what, what you see here are his, as for comparison, historical emissions for 2017, including an estimate of inventory uncertainty. Um, you see relatively wide ranges here, and that uh, of course illustrates that there are trade-offs, right? The focus can be on different sectors as long as, um, uh, the, the totals come together. But uh, let me highlight one thing here, specifically to the transport sector. Uh, unlike the other energy sectors, uh, we actually see um, that in, in some of the pathways, there's even headroom for continuing to expand transport sector emissions um, uh, um, over the next couple of decades still, which is uh, not a feature of the other sectors. Um, mostly driven by a considerable increase in uh, in service demands. We he heard this uh, in one of the previous presentations, even for Europe being the case, but of course, emerging economies as well as developing countries face a much larger challenge here with uh, expected uh, uh, demand growth uh, going to continue. So this is the two, two degree situation. If you switch to one and a half degree, the challenge becomes much, much uh, more significant. And that headroom is essentially gone uh, with 2030 global transport emissions uh, having to be um, at least um, at the 2017 level or significantly lower. Now that of course um, requires um, uh, a whole range of measures, um, which we've also uh, heard about. Let me focus here on uh, the decarbonization via um, uh, fuel switching. Electrification is one important uh, measure, as we've heard. But if I look in um, at the whole range of low carbon energy carriers in the transport sector and how they uh, would need to upscale um, under, um, in this case, a two degree scenario, or two, a set of two degree pathways, um, uh, we, we see um, by 2050 um, up to two thirds of, um, of final energy demand in the transport sector coming from low carbon sources uh, under which I subsume here electricity, hydrogen and biofuels. In particular, the latter ones have of course big questions in terms of uh, uh, being uh, really low carbon options. I'm not going to discuss that uh, in detail, but I think the, the next speaker, Anders Stroemann, uh, will, uh, will shed more light um, on, um, on the specific uh, implications, uh, greenhouse gas implications and performance of, of biofuels. But in any case, if one um, looks one level deeper um, and uh, yeah, at, at the contribution of uh, these different fuels towards decarbonization, we see a quite heterogeneous picture 
uh, with some pathways focusing mostly on electrification, others complement that by hydrogen, and then biofuels also play a, a significant role. So there is no one size fits all solution. Um, that, that's that's probably obvious. Um, getting completely around biofuels will be difficult. Thinking about aviation, um, heavy duty, we've uh, heavy duty trucks. We've heard about this, and in the near term, uh, probably even the light duty vehicle fleet. Um, um, there is a different uh, timing of deployment implied, with biofuels playing a larger role initially, but then. Um, uh, but then actually not continuing necessarily to grow. Uh, electricity um, considerably growing um, with a pretty much immediate start in hydrogen potentially towards mid-century taking um, a larger role. Now specifically uh, for the biofuels, one thing to keep in mind is um, that there is a, is a demand for uh, biomass and producing biomass sustainably um, there, there are limits uh, to, to that um, across a whole range of applications in a low, low carbon economy. So, uh, for instance, in the electricity and heat sector, as a dispatchable fuel in uh, economies that don't have uh, as generous hydro potential as, as Norway, um, could be um, an opportunity. The liquid fuels we've talked about, hydrogen production based on biomass could be an opportunity. Um, then in the industrial sector, both as a feedstock as, an, uh, as well as an energy carrier, for instance, pipe, pulp and paper, um, as a reducing agent in steel production, as a substitute for fossil uh, fuels in the petrochemical industry, and then last but not least, as a buildings material to substitute more in, uh, carbon intensive um, uh, materials in, in, in the construction sector with even the possibility to sequester carbon over longer uh, periods of time uh, as part of the building stock. Obviously, across these different um, sectors or applications that, uh, um, that would benefit from biomass as an input, um, there are to various degrees uh, alternatives available. Um, and um, this sh should be an important consideration of where we are directing the biomass feedstock and uh, as well as the biofuels um, in the transport sector. Looking at, at a study that uh, did a comparison across models, we actually see that there is no consensus emerging in two degrees uh, pathways where the biomass would go. Some see it more in the, in the power sector, others in liquids, others more towards uh, non-electric, uh, non-energy applications. Um, in, uh, so, so looking at the totality of literature, um, um, yeah, you may end up being puzzled, but there's also some insights. Um, specifically, and, and this is a study that specifically explored explore the role of electrification and its implications for um, directing uh, where to direct um, limited biomass feedstock. Um, what we see here, if, if tra transport electrification remains a limited option, then the transport sector will obviously be a large uh, demand for uh, liquid biofuels to still reduce carbon emissions. And, and other sectors to, a, to varying degree um, can only tap into this, uh, into this resource. On the other hand, um, if transport sector electrification um, in the light duty vehicle fleet, but Going significantly beyond that, uh, we've heard in the previous presentation um, uh, an, an emerging trend towards uh, uh, um, light trucks being electrified and even uh, attempts for, for doing so with heavy duty uh, vehicles. That would free up a significant amount of the biomass, limited biomass resource um, to be used in the industry sector um, and uh, as well as in non-energy applications. So yeah, um, improving, uh, improving kind of the competitiveness or uh, the, the ability to decarbonize other sectors. Let me briefly conclude here. So the, the, the pathways literature indicates a wide range of decarbonization routes. I've specifically focused here on fuel switching, but of course um, demand management, changing uh, business models and so on is, are important options as well. Specifically, I would like to highlight the competition for sustainable 
biomass with other sectors. Those include energy and non-energy sectors. So the bottom line is it's important to not only look at the performance of, uh, of certain measures within a sector, but also uh, look at the interaction with other sectors um, where, uh, where this resource might be needed even more. And uh, as a conclusion for the, for the transport sector, reduced reliance on biofuels ends up being an enabler for a more successful transformation towards a low carbon economy. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Volker Krai. I got a question uh, from Lasse Friedström to you. Is VAT on diesel fuel treated like VAT on any other commodity? I mean, do transport companies in Norway get VAT spent on diesel fuel reimbursed from the government? I think this is a question to me, not from me. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I see it's, it's more fair. We'll go back to that, Lasse. Okay. Thanks. Uh, with Volker Cray, let me go back to you. Um, one of the key questions today is on, for this webinar is how will electrification interact with biofuels and natural gas in this transition? Can you respond to that, Volker Cray? I mean, the... I'm not sure I, I get the full uh, full gist of it. Of, of course, uh, the challenge is that there are um, interactions uh, all um, yeah across all all sectors. Uh, for example, with uh, natural gas being uh, an opportunity to produce hydrogen, uh, bioenergy is the same uh, is the same. And then there you have at least in in many countries other than. Uh, uh, Norway, the challenge of uh, integrating um, uh, variable renewables into a system and balance the load across the uh, across the year, where um, where dispatchable low carbon sources become an important uh, issue as well as storage. So managing, uh, for instance, the light duty vehicle fleet um, also as a way of uh, of systems integration. Uh, seems a very important aspect from from my perspective. Otherwise, the the loads that we've uh, seen will be uh, implied by the char charging infrastructure, for example, can probably not be handled. So maybe a bit of a too generic question, but I think cross vectoral inter interactions are heavily uh, are very important to take into consideration um, for the whole system design. Thank you so much, uh, Volker Krai. If you would like to ask a question to the next speaker, please use the icon for Q&A to write your question. Um, and I will convey the, the question then. The next speaker is Anders Hammerströmer. He is a professor with the Industrial Ecology Program at NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Stroman is also a lead author for IPCC. Please, Stroman. Thank you very much, and thanks for a kind invitation and uh, for interesting presentations from the previous speakers. Um, I will try to give a brief overview of some of the, <clears throat> should we say, uh, the knowledge frontier we have in understanding some of the key options for uh, decarbonization of land transport. Um, I will start out by giving a, uh, <clears throat> a bit of a summary for different scenario studies looking at the evolution of the global light duty vehicle fleet. Um, and across these different scenario models, uh, we are looking at an increase from about um, 1 billion LDVs in 2015 um, towards uh, almost 2 to 3 billion um, uh, LDVs uh, by the mid of the century. And I'm going to use that as a context now to embark a bit into um, the electrification challenge. Um, if we're looking at some of the scenarios that do study uh, the global penetration of electric vehicles and scenarios for that, uh, the work by the National Energy Agency has, and their MOMO model has received quite a bit of uh, attention. And um, uh, this figure here shows a, um, uh, a few few of their scenarios together with the, the orange line here, which will constitute 100% penetration. And we have here the, um, the, uh, 
the brown line indicating 50% penetration. So we see, for example, that their sustainable development scenario um, is a bit um, uh, above a 50% penetration scenario. So if you stylize this now and combine this with uh, the previous figure, we can we can sort of get a, a, a back of the envelope understanding of the volumes of electric vehicles we might be looking at going forward on the global scale if we are, for example, in the envelope of 50% uh, uh, penetration of EVs versus 100% uh, penetration. And this is quite substantial. And if we if we take the, the median of, of these um, scenarios then and, and talk about, you know, how much do we have to ramp up production of batteries and the amount of gigafactories, if we, you know, take the unit of Elon Musk's gigafactory in Arizona as the benchmark here, we are, we are looking at quite substantial numbers and also quite substantial numbers of uh, BV vehicle stocks and, and, and sales down the line. And I just want to put this a bit in perspective. So these numbers are not absolute and not definitive, right? These are just indicative. It's more of a back of an envelope exercise in understanding the challenge at hand. So, you know, if we now take the mass of these, uh, these batteries that we will have to be produced at either the, the stylized scenarios here of the gray one indicating here 50% penetration or the blue one 100% penetration globally, um, the figure over at the uh, right hand side of the panel here now convert takes us from the terawatt hours per year of batteries that will have to be produced to actually sort of volumes, assuming then, um, uh, a, you know, an average density as we know it today in terms of uh, energy capacity versus mass of the batteries. And what we are seeing is that, um, um, you know, around nine or so terawatt hours we are looking at per year in terms of battery production, we're looking at mass is equivalent to that which we have in the global aluminium industry today in terms of output and that's quite significant and if you just think of it you know batteries today weigh about a quarter uh, or perhaps a, you know a, a fifth to a quarter depending on the size of the weight of the vehicles so obviously you know you know just do that ju just do those numbers and you understand that we actually are going to be looking at substantial uh, substantial volumes of mass down the line so from a circular economy perspective it's clear that when we are looking at designing this industry now uh, and designing these vehicles going forward and how this is going to evolve forward, that which is kilograms today will be megatons tomorrow in terms of batteries that we will have to recycle and, and, and handle at the end of the life. So it's a really important challenge that we tackle this. So I just want to point out that resource aspect as well of electrification. Now, obviously, the objective at hand is to mitigate climate change. So I'm not going to touch a bit on the literature, which takes us from sort of the, 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 the value chains in the production of batteries and into the climate footprint. Now there's been quite a few studies here um, that we're going to start with one on the left side of the panel. That's a fairly recent study from the Journal of Clean Production by a Chinese group, which has synthesized a few different studies. Now, there's quite a lot of studies looking at the impacts from uh, over the whole life cycle um, of, um, of production of batteries, uh, which obviously has been sort of a key point in discussing how big is the, uh, the benefit of electrification of transport today. And the, the key point to note is now, and I'm talking about the left panel here, that is really the variation in how uh, the footprint from production of batteries is divided by the main components here, whether it is the production, whether it's the cell material, whether it's the manufacturing. And this is where there's a bit of variability uh, in the literature. Now, variability in itself is not a problem per se, and it might be a representative of um, obviously different case studies being undertaken of different production systems. But it is so that while we can see sort of a bit of a declining trend in the overall footprint, there's still a bit of variation and variability in where does the footprints actually occur and what, what are the bottlenecks. And this is where there is still a bit of research which is needed um, so that we can surely guide the industry going forward in most efficiently reducing their climate footprint. And um, the overall variability of battery production transforms into uh, the, um, the, uh, the slide we have on the, or the figure we have on the right hand side, which is from the uh, fairly recent global EV outlook from the uh, International Energy uh, Agency. And um, if you can see here, this compares then battery electric vehicles, BV40, BV80, 
uh, with a few of the standard technologies that we have with ICs, hybrid electric plug-in, hybrid electric fuel cell, electric vehicle, and so on. And uh, you can note there that um, uh, in the legend, they are distinguishing, you know, what footprint do we have from the batteries? And you can see they are at 65 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilo hour and 100, that's sort of their average and max. Uh, and you can see the figure on the left side of uh, this slide where we are sort of ranging from 200 down towards 120. So they are looking, uh, or you have the lowest one down to 60 there. So, so there's clearly a span here. And a lot of these analysis that we now see, what assumptions you make on what the, the footprint of the battery production is, obviously influences the overall benchmarking. Um, Going forward, um, um, I'm bringing up here now on the right side panel a study from uh, Ricardo uh, done on behalf of the European Union, a quite extensive report. And just to illustrate that this obvious a, a point of discussion here, how, um, and in particular the grain line which you see here, is how are the footprints from battery production going to be declining going forward. Uh, and this is obviously, um, uh, if we are not quite sure where we are embarking from, predictions on how this is going to also go down is also hampered with uh, a bit of variability and uncertainty. But clearly key areas of research in this domain going forward in clarifying uh, and understanding better where we have environmental footprints in battery production, how that transforms into the footprint and also the prospective footprints of uh, battery electric uh, transportation. Then um, obviously, we all understand that um, the footprint from electric vehicles will vary with what electricity it's being run on. And this is um, um, this illustrates this figure here shows how this now varies in a fairly re the same reported from Ricardo for the um, uh, European Commission across European countries, uh, which the green line in the center indicating the average. So this sort of states the obvious. Um, the lower footprint of electricity, the more comparative advantage in terms of carbon footprint you have versus the conventional technologies. And, and this, this is now geospatially sort of distributed across, across countries, but it, it could obviously, it's the same dynamic we will have going forward um, as different countries uh, will be decarbonizing uh, at different paces. Uh, so that brings up a bit also a question about the timing, when to, when to electrify transportation and how fast we are going to do that. And the question is sort of, do we have a uniform policy on electrification across the European Union or do we differentiate depending on uh, the electricity mixes, for example, across uh, the different countries? So um, that was a bit for the um, electric transport. Now a little bit on the um, the uh, a little bit on the uh, 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 the fuel cell transportation. Uh, a bit same type of story as well. Obviously, a bit of footprints stemming from uh, the production of, and that's what you have on the both the uh, the right hand uh, figure and the left hand figure here. Um, if we focus on the left hand figure, we also see the. Uh, the variation in what type of feedstock we are using for the production of the hydrogen. So basically we have the key point here, also production uh, of the fuel cell systems and in particular storage, the tanks uh, also contribute quite a bit as of now. And we also need to obviously look at uh, what value chains we are going to use. And across these, the footprints will vary quite, 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 uh, quite a bit. And if we then look across all these different options, what we basically see here in this figure uh, at the very bottom here, the battery electric vehicle across different prospective assumptions as well, how this is going forward. Battery electric vehicles typically comes out at the lower end uh, of all the options we have, uh, given that we are on a sound trajectory of decarbonizing the uh, electricity sector. So with that, I'll leave the, the fuel cell and the uh, electrification and say a few words about biofuels before I wrap it up. So we have recently gotten this ILUC regulations, uh, which obviously been a debate that's been going on for quite some years, um, which has the ambition of basically understanding how we might attribute indirect land use changes uh, to increasing demand for biofuels. That is that we cause deforestation as a result of biofuel demand. Now, um, this study here has looked at the variability uh, of different models and approaches to calculate these ILUC factors. And the, the basic 
conclusion is that this is a um, this is this is challenging to reach a consensus on this matter, and it's hard to foresee any convergence and any and any uh, broad agreement on what these ILUC factors should be. Uh, they further point to a bit the the uh, the challenge uh, that what we actually have at hand here is an attempt to manage global land um, and how manage global land use transition. So in um, through ILOC policies, we effectively try to influence um, land management policies uh, in other parts of the world. So European ILOC policies are trying to deal with land use change in Southeast Asia. Now, the general insights is that um, uh, indirect land use change is principally, uh, you know, the sum of all indirect land use change has to sum up to the total land use change across the globe. And the question which is generally being discussed, uh, you know, is the, the efficiency of ILUC policies versus basically um, land management policies in the regions where uh, deforestation is a problem. And uh, the, there's generally, the general thinking is that if you can have efficient policies in place there, which are implemented in some manner, that is more efficient. But the problem has been that local uh, um, land management policies has really not been efficient in avoiding deforestation. So that's sort of the conundrum we have. However, uh, despite the fact that we um, biofuels are and, and demand, and this is the point which is being raised, irrespective of what agriculture or biomass product you are looking at an increased demand add, you will be looking at these indirect land use changes. So a key point is also that you shouldn't just look at our look for fuels. You should also be um, trying to understand how uh, increased demand for food, increased demand for fiber um, and for building materials um, and wooden building materials is also uh, causing indirect um, uh, land use uh, changes and that uh, um, that we basically need to have a broader perspective of how we manage our lands. So final slide now. Um, uh, across then uh, these models that look at the big picture and, and folk brought up, um, brought up some results from these in the uh, previous presentation. Um, what we do see is that um, within um, a two degree trajectory, one does find um, the need for uh, the use of biomass for energy or fuels, uh, and that takes into account um, uh, challenges to deforestation and keeps track of uh, uh, changes in, in land use. So these models that look at the complete puzzle actually finds quite a bit of need for biomass for energy purposes. And as Focus said, it varies a bit um, between um, whether it's for energy or for fuels between these different models. So um, the, it still means that we, we need to still work on that option. Uh, it seems to be concerning to leave it out. Uh, it seems that the uh, biomass for energy or fuels is an option we still need to work on. Uh, in parallel uh, with electrification, hydrogen, and uh, the other options that we are studying. So I think that's where I would like to land on uh, on that matter. And um, uh, greetings from a beautiful fall in Hockenheim. Yes. Thanks so much, Anders Hammerström. Um, I got one question in here that's very specific on battery recycling. Uh, what is the status quo in this field today in terms of technology? Can you answer that? Yeah, that would, could, the, the, there are indeed uh, a lot of research and also commercial um, uh, actors working on this. Uh, so, so um, I would say it's a, it is a, um, it is a industry which is uh, growing, and uh, there are. Um, um, uh, but obviously, in, in the bigger picture, if you look at the volumes, we, 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 we shouldn't think that this will just happen by itself. I think incentives uh, to put good, um, good uh, to, to, to um, stimulate technology development and also uh, systemic thinking around how we are going to deal with these, uh, th these new mass streams in society is uh, sensible. So, uh, technology is evolving um, and uh, recycling rates are going up and the ability to refine more and more of the 
material is is uh, advancing, um, but we also have the options of second use of these batteries and the balance between reuse of battery packs after their life in vehicles versus recycling is still some aspect that needs to be better understood and, and uh, discussed. Thank you so much, Anders Hammer Strömmann. Our next speaker is senior researcher Kari Omot Espegren at Institute for Energy Technology, IFE, and Norwegian Center for Transition Strategy and Trans. Please, Espegren. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And now we are going to the sustainable transition more and look on the Norwegian perspective for the next 10 years. Um, uh, the yeah, future energy mix in the Norwegian road transport system. Uh, and this presentation is made on research mainly done in a project called Integrated Transport and Energy Modeling, but it's also based on research we have done in MOSES and in uh, other projects. And what we do is to try to improve the modeling of zero emission transport infrastructure uh, to be able to give policy advice to the government and also investment support to energy and industry uh, actors. And you can see all the participants in the project. And it, this project is supported by the uh, Research Council in Norway. So what we do is that we try to do energy modeling very detailed uh, on a local scale, but also on a national scale. And now I will first give you some insights to the modeling and then a few uh, words about the assumption before I go to the results, because I think it's important that you know something about um, uh, the tools we use when you look at the results and also the, uh, the assumptions we make, because they are very important for the, for the, the, the results of the modeling. So what we do now is that we model specific locations in the transport corridor between Oslo and Trondheim and Oslo and Bergen. Uh, so that we can actually study uh, where it's useful to have both hydrogen production and refueling station uh, and uh, where it's possible and uh, to have this fast charging for both small or light duty vehicles, personal vehicles, but also heavy. Do we need uh, huge battery storage? Do we need grid in reinforcement? And we try now to, to locate this um, uh, stations where there is a need for it in the transport system, but also where it's uh, possible in, in the electricity system. And we use this local scale modeling into a national level modeling. We use a, a framework called TIMES, as, and we have our uh, IFE TIMES Norway model, where we model the whole energy system. Uh, from uh, the resources uh, and the conversion processes into uh, end use of all different fuels and in all uh, end use sectors, industry, buildings, and transport. And these are then divided in a set of uh, subsectors. And for us, it's important to model the whole energy system uh, so that we can be able to see uh, impacts from one sector into the other. Uh, an important word here is the sector coupling. Uh, in the recent year, the transport has been much more co uh, cobbled to the rest of the energy system than it uh, previously was when we only used uh, fossil fuels for the transport sector. When we are using more and more biomass and electricity into the transport sector, it is linked with the rest of the energy system. And by using this uh, technology-rich energy system model, we can get a cost optimization where we see what is most cost effective of the different technologies. When should we invest in new technologies? What will the energy flows be? And, um, and also the, the prices of the di different technologies. So here is just one example of uh, a value chain that we model. This is the hydrogen uh, value chain. Uh, it, and if you look at the, um, the left-hand side, you can see that we can produce electricity from different sources. Uh, electricity, 
uh, from the distribution grid or from local electricity production farms. We can use the, and have small scale uh, electrolyzers or we could use uh, the regional grid and produce more on a high levels, large electrolyzers. We could also use natural gas with the methane reforming. And this, um, and then we can have to transport, store hydrogen uh, and use it in different sectors. And in this presentation then I will focus on the light duty vehicles and the heavy duty vehicles in the transport sector uh, where and how this is used in, uh, will be used for the future in the Norwegian road transport. We have different modeling, the same kind of modeling for all other energy carriers, but so this was just as an example. And then it's to the main modeling assumptions. For this analysis, we have used the forecast of tra future transport demand, which is in the national transport plan. Uh, we could have also included different um, uh, forecasts uh, with uh, more modal shifts, more less energy or less transport demand, but we have you now chosen to use the national transport plan as the basis in this analysis. When it comes to technology costs uh, and efficiencies, we have based our technology learning from uh, the recent Klimakur work and also updates from recent international research on the technology development for the future. And uh, we include different policy measures, taxes, fees, uh, blending of biofuels, for instance, uh, and the, the mix in the fossil deals, diesels, which, um, yeah, that's included, but we have not included any support schemes uh, in this analysis. We could be ANOVA support schemes for infrastructure or so on. Uh, so that can of course be done, but that's not done in this analysis. And, and here's a picture of which powertrains that are applied in the different road transport modes. So not all different vehicle types can use all kinds of technologies, but uh, at least plug-in hybrids is only for cars and vans. That's what we have used now in the model. We have also included some other uh, assumptions related to uh, efficiencies. What you can see here on the left hand side is that energy efficiency of the EV is dependent on the outside um, temperature. It, uh, so you use a lot more electricity uh, when the temperature is low and that this kind of efficiency curves is included in the model. And also the charging profile of EVs uh, is included as this is important for peak demand uh, EVs. Uh, so we have based uh, our studies on this kind of charging in, uh, load profile with, um, yeah. And then to the analysis that we actually have done, uh, this is should be sort of um, sustainable uh, transition. We have as a reference also included uh, scenarios without uh, CO2 restrictions. Uh, that's um, A and B. But uh, we have then also wanted to look at the restriction on biofuels. Uh, we have been discussing earlier today also Volker Gray's presentation included this problem with the competition for sustainable biomass. So what we have wanted to study is how can we, what will be the difference if we have import of bio, biofuels from abroad to Norway or if we do not allow for um, biofuel import. So those, um, so we have this analysis with um, import restriction on biofuels and with not and with CO2 limitations and not. And if it, the CO2 limitations is a 90% reduction of CO2 emissions in 2050 compared to 2016 and 40% reduction in 2030. So this is the, and then what do we then observe? Uh, 
just look at um, C and D, where we have restrictions on um, uh, on import of biomass. Without CO2 re reductions, um, uh, that's A and B. They are sort of very similar. Uh, what we see in A and B is that we have uh, huge electrification, uh, and this is the whole the uh, road transport. Uh, for C, without import restrictions of uh, biomass, we see no hydrogen, but when we restrict the, uh, the possibility for imports of biofuels, we see the yellow one with hydrogen. Then we see an, um, that hydrogen is an option. And we also see the orange one, that biogas is actually then um, economic, uh, cost effective to, uh, to invest in more biogas for transport purposes. Uh, I have now divided these results into different types of vehicles. So the first one on the left side here is cars. Uh, sort of the main observation is that the, the energy use is approximately halved, even then uh, that the, the transport demand increases. So that's sort of the benefit of using battery electric vehicles. They are much more effective. And we see that we will have um, uh, a high share of battery electric vehicles in all the scenarios. If you look at the buses, we see that um, it's the bus fleet that will go for biogas if we restrict uh, the import of biomass to Norway. Uh, if not, they will use bio blended biofuel in the diesel. So, so that's sort of the difference between those two. Uh, and if you look at energy use for freight, um, sort of the main result here is the same as we have looked into when we look at the total picture, that if we cannot use this high amount of biofuels in Norway, we will have to rely on the new technologies and we will use fuel cell electric vehicles with hydrogen for the trailers, also for the tracks, uh, but not for vans. And um, the analysis show that it is sort of very hard to find, um, or we do not have policies in place that will um, support uh, the change from ICEs in France to, to, uh, to battery electric vehicles. They mostly uh, go for plug-in uh, hybrid solutions for the vans. Uh, but what we then observe, of course, we have uh, only three options uh, when we look at the decarbonization of the transport sector, there are three fuels available. It's hydrogen, it's biofuels, and it is electricity. Um, and I would like to sort of to look at this um, graph uh, when we look at the increased use of biofuel. Uh, because when we increase the use of biofuels in the transport sector, this implies that there will be a reduction of uh, biofuels or bioenergy that is available for other purposes. And then it's the heating sector that will be reducing the use of biofuels. You can see that uh, in the two graphs on the right hand side here, that when the, in the yellow bar with a high increase of uh, bioenergy in the transport sector, we will have a reduction in the heat sector and also in the, the tran uh, and for the D where we restrict the, um, the imports, we have less use in uh, the heat sector. And uh, when we do then this uh, uh, system analysis, we see that this heat in the heating sector is, the bio is replaced by electricity. And we see the same when we look at hydrogen. 
Uh, hydrogen is mainly produced by electrolysis. It's 70, 70 terawatt hours in the analysis we have. And this have, an, of course, an impact on the electricity generation. So then there's a need for increased electricity generation to produce the hydrogen or uh, a need for reduce electricity on other sectors, but that is not sort of what we see in our analysis. So what we do in the transport sector has major impacts in other sectors. So that's sort of an important message from me that it's important to have a holistic approach to look at the whole energy system when we look at policies and the measures to decarbonize, uh, decarbonize the transport sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kari Espergren. Uh, we'll put that in mind and holistic approach. Uh, I'm afraid you spent all your time. So if there is any, sorry. Yeah, any Q and A, we have to move on um, and take them at the end. Our next speaker now is uh, Dr. Margret Wolfhard Mehrens at ZSW, the Center for Solar Energy and Hydrogen Research. And uh, Margret is based in Ulm in Germany. Please. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much. I will take you a little bit about uh, in sustainable battery production. This is more a technical uh, presentation based on five years experience with a, a research production line for lithium, uh, lithium ion batteries. We already saw from Anders Hammer's presentation the huge increase of battery electric vehicles and all these vehicles need batteries and at the moment these batteries are coming more or less from Asia so they have to be transported uh, from Asia to, uh, uh, to Europe. But during the last year, we had a lot of announcement for lithium ion battery production in, uh, in Europe. You can see here, maybe Germany is a little bit over uh, represented for all, uh, all this data came from press releases uh, end of 2018 to end of uh, 2019. And more than 310 gigawatt hours battery production are announced for Europe um, within the next 10, uh, 10 years. This should be sufficient for uh, a, few million, uh, a few million cars. If we are looking on the sustainability of the complete value chain of lithium ion batteries, normally we have to start from the raw materials, mining of raw materials, then production of active materials, which take more or less 40 to, uh, to 50 percent of all energy consumption of a, a lithium ion battery. Then we have the battery uh, manufacturing application and hopefully also in the future recycling of uh, res uh, full recycling of these batteries to get new raw materials from spent end of life uh, batteries and to get a few full circular economy with recycling and second, uh, second life. What we have to take into account is uh, the raw materials and uh, resourcing of the raw materials, energy consumption for cell production, and of course, uh, course also the energy mix which is used for this uh, cell, uh, cell production. If we look at the raw materials, um, here I have summarized what the demand on active materials for 500,050 kilowatt hour uh, batteries for, uh, for cars. We need active material 
graphite or graphite silicon on the anode side and different cathode materials. And what you can see here that with increasing capacity of the active material, uh, we decrease the raw material demand for the material. This means that an increase of energy density in the battery is directly related with the reduction of the demand of raw materials. And assuming that the raw material always needs the same energy consumption in battery production, we also find a reduction of energy consumption for battery, uh, battery production. Therefore, um, it's needed to uh, develop new materials, more uh, materials with increased energy density um, to reduce uh, to reduce the energy co uh, consumption. If you look at the different steps of uh, cell production, we start with the electrode manufacturing, mixing of materials, uh, coating, drying, densification, and then come to the cell assembling, slitting, stacking, winding, contacting, housing, and filling with electrolyte, and at the end, formation of the batteries. And if we look at the energy consumption per cell and the reduction potential, you see here, sorry, I see uh, here it's in uh, German. We see here the energy, co uh, energy consumption for the different, uh, different, uh, different steps, mixing, coating, calendaring, and, uh, and so on. And you can see here that for electrode pr uh, preparation, we knew, uh, need nearly uh, one third, but the energy consumption for the cell assembly and the formation process is uh, dominant. Uh, most, energy, uh, most energy consumption uh, go to this, uh, to this step. And how can we reduce the energy consumption and come to a more sustainable cell production. There are different steps to go. For example, at the moment, the anode is prepared by an aqueous coating process and the cathode is prepared from an uh, organic solvent. And replacing this organic solvent, NMP, by an aqueous uh, coating process would lead to reduced material consumption, but also to a reduced energy consumption. Another possibility is to go from wet coatings to extrusion processes and to dry coating to reduce the energy which is needed for the drying process in the electrode, pre uh, electrode preparation. Another, uh, another measure is to increase the loading of the electrodes so that um, we can shorten the, uh, shorten the process. For the cell, assemb uh, cell assembling, one way is to go to increase cell size, this means reduction of passive materials, reduction of individual processes, a full inline inspection and data processing to reduce waste or also to detect waste uh, uh, directly in the beginning of the manufacturing uh, process. But most of the energy consumption in the assembling line goes for, cli uh, for the climate. Uh, the man uh, manufacturing is inside a, a dry room. This means reducing dry room space, going to micro environments and not to a complete line in a big uh, dry room and a very intelligent energy man uh, 
very intelligent energy management in total. And for formation, which also costs a lot of, uh, lot of energy, it's possible normally the formation process, this means this is the first charging process of the battery and also the first discharging, uh, discharging uh, pro uh, process. It would be good to have a, a full recuperation of, um, of the formation process so that we can use the energy from, uh, from discharge, uh, discharging for the complete menu, uh, menu, uh, menu, uh, manuf uh, manufacturing. And all this, um, all these techniques are under investigation and uh, are developed uh, at the moment. And one very promising uh, step is to have um, intelligent uh, manufacturing with complete data-based quality control for electrode and cell, uh, cell production so that it's possible um, to have an um, optimized energy, energy man management and also to reduce uh, waste or early detection and uh, reducing of uh, scrap so that it's not, uh, not necessary to go the whole manufacturing process with um, small amounts of um, based, uh, based, uh, based material. But of course, the uh, um, biggest issue is the uh, sustain, uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable energy. We have a high um, uh, energy demand for cell assembly in very conservative uh, estimations or calculations. It's uh, 50 kilowatt hour electric for uh, one kilowatt hour uh, uh, battery. And of course, this, the carbon footprint is dominated by this energy consumption for the cell manufacturing. And this is determined by the energy, uh, energy, uh, energy mix. And it's really very important to, to go from fossil energy mix to renewable, uh, renewable, en uh, renewable energies. This is, the main, uh, this is the main point that the battery, uh, battery pr uh, pr uh, production, the carbon, uh, carbon footprint is really um, determined by uh, the source of, uh, of, uh, of energy, uh, energy mix. And the only way um, to have an optimized carbon footprint is to use as much as possible renewable energy for battery uh, for uh, for this battery uh, production uh, production. Of course, it's also possible to reduce the energy uh, energy con uh, consumption, but the most important point is to use um, a non-fossil energy mix from renewable, uh, renewable energies. Here it's uh, from a, um, a German, uh, German uh, study from the EFOI uh, Institute. You can see the greenhouse gas emissions of battery manufacturing for one kilowatt hour battery from different different sources or different, uh, different studies. And you can see that there is a really huge variation of um, greenhouse gas, em uh, gas emissions dependent, uh, dependent, on, uh, dependent on, uh, on the study and dependent on the source of um, energy, energy mix. So in total, what do we need for a more sustainable battery value chain? An increase of energy efficiency along the whole battery production, starting with the raw materials. An increase of the amount of renewable energy as power source as uh, 
much as possible, maximize the productivity of batteries in the application in the application life. Increase of batteries should not lead to decrease of um, lifetime of the bat uh, battery. Establish a second life use after end of life of the batteries and also establish efficient recycling routes for circular, uh, for complete circular recovery of the, um, of the, uh, better, of the battery uh, materials and um, come a little bit become a little bit independent from, uh, the, raw, uh, from the raw materials. Some of these raw materials also consume a lot of energy and um, have a um, large carbon dioxide uh, uh, footprint if they come from primary, res uh, primary re uh, resources. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Margaret. Um, our time is actually up, but I will allow one question for you, if you can answer briefly, please. Will Europe be able to produce all the batteries needed for the electrification of the transport sector? Or will we be dependent on imports from other countries like China? Also at the moment, um, at the moment we are completely dependent on, uh, on other countries. At the, uh, at the moment, um, yeah, we are dependent on uh, countries like um, Korea and China. Um, if we if we assume that um, battery production will come to Europe as as uh, as announced, it will it will take a few years to catch uh, catch up, but it will be possible. Thank so you so that, much. That we uh, become more more independent from other countries than uh, than today. And if we also install a complete um, circular uh, economy, uh, we can also be not completely, but more independent also from other raw material resources. Thanks very much. That's leaving us on a high note there. And um, our Final speaker today is Professor of Environmental Psychology, Linda Steg, and maybe you have the key to the castle. Understanding environmental behavior, in particular household energy use and car use is included in Linda Steg's expertise. Please, uh, Linda Steg. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Perfect, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, so I come up with a different perspective, a psychological perspective, and I will focus in my presentation on what motivates people to contribute to the decarbonization of transportation, but also what makes that they find all kinds of policies aimed to promote this acceptable. Well, oftentimes it's being assumed that people are mostly motivated by their self-interest in the short term, and because of this one prominent strategy that's often used to uh, trigger people to change their behavior, to reduce carbon emissions in transportation, for example, is by making this behavior financially attractive and making the undesired behavior financially unattractive. Well, this is surely needed in many cases when cost of low carbon options are very uh, high then people need to be supported to adopt these options but it's not the silver bullet that uh, would solve all our problems but pricing can be effective i demonstrate this on the basis of a field study that we did uh, in which we installed gps devices in people's cars and uh, the, the participants were young drivers they could earn a, a discount on their insurance premium if they would drive in an energy efficient way because then they would uh, emit less carbon so uh, part of the group received this incentive the reward and uh, another part didn't 
the control group and the dotted line is the control group and uh, there was a pre-measure, two intervention periods and a post-measure and on the dotted line, the control group, you see that people speeded less in the initially, so uh, that means uh, that they uh, emitted less CO2 at that times and increased steadily and it's probably because they knew initially that they were being watched. So we installed GPS in their car and they thought, ooh, I should behave properly and later they forget. But let's see what happens with the inter uh, intervention group, those who receive the, uh, in, uh, the discount on the insurance premium. They started speeding less when they got the rewards, so when they could earn money with it. They kept on doing this in the intervention period, but as soon as the reward was retracted, so they were no longer receiving money for not speeding, they did exactly the same as the control group anymore. So rewards can help, financial, offering financial benefits might help, but then they should be and stay in place, otherwise people see no longer any reason to do the desired behavior. Another example about pricing, uh, emphasizing financial benefits of, uh, of uh, behavior. So this is a question to you. We did a study uh, at a, a gas uh, station uh, in the US and we wanted to promote uh, the people, or we encourage people to check their tire pressure. And we wanted to see what types of benefits should you emphasize to make them do so. Should you tell them, hey, if your tires are properly inflated, you, reduce, you use less gasoline, and that's how you protect the environment, CO2 emissions would reduce. Or should you say, well, if you do so, you save money. And we had a control condition with no arguments to uh, see what the reference point would be, what would happen if nothing would uh, be communicated. So please reflect for a minute, which of these appeals do you think would be most important? Uh, effective to promote tire uh, pressure checks? Well, anytime I present it, most people think the financial message works best because it's tangible, people understand the meaning and they can use it immediately. And a kilogram of CO2 emission reduction doesn't tell us much. What we found is that the financial appeal was the least effective. The environmental appeal was the most effective. How come? Well, uh, that we did all kinds of follow-up research and one reason why the financial appeal is not very effective is that people start engaging in cost-benefit analysis and they realize what can I earn with doing this behavior and many behaviors that we do in daily life. They offer little environmental benefits, though they, so they don't think it's worth the effort. They find the same behavior more worth the effort when you re-emphasize the environmental gains compared to the financial gains. So why do they think the environmental gains are worth the effort? Because people, like I said, many people don't understand what a kilogram of CO2 emission reduction would involve. Well, this is mainly because doing something good for the environment makes us feel good. We do something meaningful. We contribute to the greater good. That feels good. And that motivates us to act accordingly. So anticipating these positive feelings makes that we are willing to do something for the environment, even though it might be somewhat bothersome. So this indicates already that people are not only driven by their self-interest, they also consider the interest of uh, other people or benefits for the environment, which could be emphasized for, to promote uh, pro-environmental sustainable actions. So uh, let's go uh, to uh, another type of motive that might also play a role next to financial motivations. This is a study we did on what motivates people to adopt an electric vehicle in the Netherlands. In the, and we did a study in a time that not many people had an electric vehicle. And still uh, in the Netherlands, not many people have uh, an electric vehicle, not to the same extent as in Norway. What we did in this study is we asked people, what are important motives for you to consider buying an electric vehicle? Is it, do you mainly consider the instrumental function? And that's concerns like, uh, what is the range? How often do I need to charge? Uh, what are the costs? That type of considerations. Or environmental, do you want to benefit to uh, the benefit the environment? Or is it the symbolic function as well? Is it because the electric vehicles tell something about me to myself and to others? Is it a status symbol, for example? 
If you ask people directly, they indicate yes, the in instrumental aspects are important and that mainly inhibits the adoption of electric vehicles in that time particularly because it's bothersome to charge your electric vehicle. It's very costly still and uh, yeah, you need to wait uh, for charging it, etc. And the range is uh, rather small. Environmental reasons, people also said, yes, very important to me. While the symbolic reasons, they said, yeah, that is not something that would drive my behavior. Next, we considered what actually predicts whether they would consider adopting an electric vehicle. So which of these motives best predicts the likelihood that people consider adopting an electric vehicle? Well, that's what you see in this uh, uh, slide. Clearly, the instrumental function, people say, yes, very important for me, is a non-significant predictor if we also consider the other motives. So what mostly drives people's uh, intention to adopt an electric vehicle is because they think it benefits the environment, but even more so because they think it says something positive about them to self and to others. And the interesting thing was that the signaling function was a better predictor when people thought the electric vehicle was not that nice still, whether they thought it had more disadvantages. Probably because the more disadvantages it has and, the, and you are still willing to consider using it, then it clearly says something about you. You don't do it because it's the best thing to do. You, you are willing to suffer to make this happen. Similar, we found that when people thought that not many people, other people would consider driving an electric vehicle, the signaling function was more predictive. Probably for the same reason, if not many people do it, it's probably not a sensible thing to do, not the most beneficial thing to do. So then it says more about me. And this signaling function can be particularly relevant for all kinds of innovations where not many people already have the behavior. So here you see the comparison with what people say and what actually predicts their behavior. So we also saw, uh, considered for whom are these uh, uh, symbolic attributes the most important reason? Uh, and does it matter in what uh, stage, uh, uh, adoption stage people are, the innovators, people that do things first without hardly anyone doing it, to the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and the traditionalists. And below you see the number of these categories. And what you clearly see is that innovators, those who are most likely to be the first adopters, they evaluate these symbolic motives also highest. So for them, it is particularly interesting. And that is uh, for introducing innovations an important issue. So if you emphasize the symbolic attributes, it is very relevant for these types, uh, for, the, for the innovators. They are willing to suffer and, and to take some cost for granted uh, to have the symbolic uh, uh, function uh, problems. And as, as they adopted the, uh, the uh, innovation, like an electric vehicle already, it will become more attractive because economies of scale and then the later groups are motivated for these other reasons probably. This about what motivates people to engage in sustainable behavior uh, in transportation behavior associated with low carbon emissions. Now I move to what motivates people to accept policy. Here it's also often assumed people accept the policy when it has more benefits and lower cost for them. And again, this is relevant, but not the only relevant factor. Like I said, people not all, all, uh, only consider financial costs and benefits, but also environmental costs and benefits already, for example, or symbolic factors. But besides this, there's other types of factors also motivating change. People also consider whether costs and benefits are distributed equally in society. So they're more likely to accept policy or system changes when they think that people are affected to the same extent and that not people, some people, some groups are disproportionately affected. That was one of the reasons why the Yellow Fest movement, for example, was very prominent. They were not so much anti-climate action, they were very much concerned about the unequal distribution of uh, the cost of uh, climate policy. Another relevant factor is procedural fairness. 
Do people have the feeling that their concerns have been taken into account seriously? Or did they have to, a chance to have a say? Could they participate in the decision making? This can also enhance the acceptability of policies. And people are willing to accept policies that are not in their best interest if they have the feeling that their concerns have been taken into account or if they had the opportunity to participate. Another factor is trust, whether you think that the actor implementing the policy can be trusted and whether the policy is implemented with the goal that they, it is presented to be. So if people have a low trust in policy in, in the government, they might also object all kinds of policies. And another uh, last factor that is relevant is that it might be good to have some trials so that people can experience what is happening and see whether a policy would have beneficial effects. And this can be demonstrated on, uh, on the basis of the uh, Stockholm congestion charge that was implemented after a trial period. So we did a study before and after the trial period. So for uh, six months, the congestion charge was being implemented and it meant that when you entered or left the Stockholm city center, you had to pay. And we wanted to know what people, how people evaluated the policy before the implementation and after the trial period. And before the implementation on the right hand side, you see, uh, oh, sorry, the, on the left and right is difficult for me sometimes. Acceptability was lower before the implementation than after the implementation. And after the, the trial period, people in Stockholm voted in favor of this scheme. So they really wanted it to have it in place. So why was acceptability increased? Well, it appeared that the effects were more better, more favorable than people anticipated beforehand. So traffic jams were reduced more, environmental problems were reduced more, there were less parking problems than they would anticipate, and they paid less than they anticipated. So it might be that before an implementation, people are too skeptical, and if you implement a policy and demonstrate what is happening, people might come to see like, oh, this is not too bad after all. And this is also something that we have experienced during the, the Corona crisis, right? Dramatic changes happens. And many of these changes, people recognize like, oh, it's not too bad. So let's go into this in a bit more detail. Like I said, in the Corona crisis, dramatic changes happened also in transportation. Many people were working at home. I'm still mostly working at home. Probably many of you as well. Uh, and that was mostly also because there were very clear regulations and advices from central governments. They were very clear what could and what could not happen. All kinds of facilities were locked down and people just couldn't go there anymore. Very clear, forceful leadership. And what we think also happened is because of that, strong personal norms were appearing. People felt morally obliged to help solve this crisis to prevent that more people would get ill or even die because of the crisis. And this was all being uh, uh, triggered by uh, the, the actions and the communications that took place in many societies, not in all, but in many, in the Netherlands for sure, and I, I guess in Norway the same. It was very clear what the negative consequences were of Corona, that people could actually die a horrible, horrible uh, situations in the hospitals. The individual responsibilities were also very clear. People knew about social distancing, avoiding contact, close contact with people, for example. Uh, the, it was also very clear which actions were required. So people were, uh, were very much aware, oh, I can do this. I can engage in these actions. It's my capability to do so. It was also clear that if everyone would do so, the actions would be effective and because societies were closed down because social distances uh, thing was very prominently uh, adopted indeed the incident uh, people getting in the number of people getting in ill and dying was reduced significantly with strong social norms it was very clear what uh, uh, behavior was the right thing to do and it was also very clear that many people engaged in these behaviors and all kinds of governments implemented supporting policies and regulations. So people were offered facilities to work at home. Companies who had a hard time were uh, uh, supported by the government. So this all 
made it uh, very clear what the uh, behavior would be desired and people felt obliged, morally obliged, uh, very responsible in contributing. The question is, of course, will these changes uh, stay? Will these changes be durable? And that is something that we have to wait and see. But I, I recently saw uh, yesterday, actually, a study from a, a Dutch uh, institute that uh, indicated that many people still consider working at home even after the corona crisis, so that would mean less commuting travel. Although it also indicated that particularly people who travel by public transport would consider working at home more often as compared to people who regularly drive to work. Thank you very much, Lisa. I always acknowledge our group because I clearly do, the, do this work on my own. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you so much, Linda Steg. What a beautiful group you have. I have two questions for you. Um, first, do you see a big difference between young and older people in your studies? And second, if insights from norms and environmental concerns, concerns, willingness to pay and so on, as described by Linda, was included in cost-optimized energy system models like Times Norway, how would results change? Yeah. Is it advisable or possible to include such factors in this kind of modeling? Thank you so much. Good questions. So the first questions, are there big differences between the young and the older people? Well, if you look at, we often look at values, general goals that people uh, strive for, and environmental values are a very strong driver of sustainable action. And we recently uh, published a study that this is not, you cannot say the young people are more pro-environmental than the old people that they don't care about the environment more than the young people. Social demographics like age, gender, uh, income, education level, family uh, situation, only predicted together something like 9% of the variance. So it's not, you can not clearly label a, a person as very pro-environmental or not. There are some studies suggesting that the young people are more into the sharing economy, not having their own car, for example, anymore. anymore. That would clearly benefit the environment. But the question is, of course, whether this is temporary and whether they will adopt these things when they become um, start uh, raising a family or become richer, so to speak. Including this type of factors in the models. Yes, we are working on this. And I collaborate a lot with people from system and control uh, uh, um, technology at uh, the system and, no, system and control. What is it? <laughs> Not technology. Uh, so people who uh, develop algorithms to manage the energy grid. And we try to get this type of fact, these type of factors into their algorithms. And we have some indications that it would change in, indeed, because these algorithms now include very basic assumptions about human behavior, mostly that people uh, uh, are very responsive to price signals, which is not always the case. And that is what we are showing already. And we did something on transport models a long time ago also, demonstrating that if you include these type of factors, the outcomes will change. But it would also imply that you can model all kinds of different policies that target the factors that I have been discussing. Thank you so much, Linda Steg. Wonderful. Um, what to take away today? What are the advice to policymakers? This is the last and important task today to sum up and conclude. And to help us, we have asked Oskar Thomasgar and Eystein Ulleberg. And we will also take some of the remaining questions. And if there are remarks from the other speakers, you are welcome. We will end at 11.20. Um, would you please start, Eystein Ulleberg? Yes, uh, first of all, thanks a lot to uh, all the speakers. This was really wonderful. You did a great job. It's an extremely compact format and very precise information. So thanks a lot for that. Um, I, I made some notes on the way and, um, you know, I, I kicked the whole thing off uh, talking about the EU perspective with the saying that uh, reducing and shifting the transport demand uh, is important and thus it comes in the uh, 
uh, session after me and says that maybe that's not the most important, but it's the efficiency, which we also agree on. So we need to clearly the technology development on the battery electric vehicles and the fuel cell vehicles, for instance, um, and also a switch uh, to the renewable base. Both we heard from uh, switching to the fuel itself, uh, uh, renewable fuel itself, uh, but also uh, renewable energy as a base for the manufacturing, for instance, in the case of uh, battery production, which we heard uh, excellent talk on towards the end. Um, one uh, learning lesson from Norway, we saw that, uh, and uh, we, we, we at least we have now explained that we, we're not subsidizing our development in zero emission uh, transport. We, we are, we are tax, we're using taxation systems and uh, very, uh, clear uh, example uh, there from, from Norway. Um, but we see also some markets that might be challenging to, to um, um, where it will be challenging to just use these measures. So we might have to go in and interfere, for instance, on the fast charging and possibly also on hydrogen refueling. Then we walked into the uh, more these scenarios, look, taking the holistic view, um, <coughs> very interesting to see you know, this in context that, you know, what is really required of the transport sector in the 2030 perspective. And we, we heard that we needed to be on 2017 level, uh, according to this IPCC report, if we're going to reach the 1.5 degree scenario. Uh, it's also then interesting to see uh, how, how the technologies compare that batteries are sort of 10 years ahead of, for instance, hydrogen. Then we went into LCA. Um, and we, get, we got some real concrete figures uh, where we looked into, um, you know, what does it actually mean, you know, when we really start to electrify in terms of the materials that need to go into this. And uh, um, we saw that uh, there are, are uh, actually quite a few gigafactories that need to be built if we are going to meet our, our goals. Uh, then we looked into the batteries, the actual environmental footprint of making the batteries, the example of the NCM batteries. Uh, that today use sort of 60 to 200 uh, kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour, but there's potential to go down to 10 uh, tons then of, uh, sorry, tons of CO2 per kilowatt. So our, so, so um, uh, with these technology developments that we learned from um, uh, to the end, uh, we, we hopeful that we can get the cost of the battery manufacturing down and that a lot of this battery manufacturing can, um, uh, be done in an environmental friendly way, both on electro manufacturing, cell assembly and formation. And we learned that each of those uh, parts in the manufacturing process takes about 30%, contributes about 30% of the emissions each. So, so that's, that's very interesting. Um, then towards the end now, we, we heard about uh, sector coupling. Uh, um, there was, um, and there's been discussion um, point here also in the chat on this which uh, I think is very interesting. And I, I think that could be my cue to um, Oscar because uh, Oscar and his group works a lot on, on exactly this topic. How do we couple the transport sector to the other sectors and, and look at this in, in totality? Um, I also noted that uh, there is a little bit of a discrepancy on biofuels and, um, and that it's clearly a, um, <laughs> A policy issue, for instance, the example in this times model, where if you if you curb the import on biofuels, you get a very different result than if you don't. So I think that's a very interesting topic. So again, thanks a lot for your contributions. Lovely, I stand Ulleberg, and then I give the microphone to Asker Thomaska, please. Thank you, and I would also like to thank the, the speakers for excellent introductions to this discussion. And uh, you gave us a challenge in, in summarizing how to make this, uh, translate this into policy relevance, of course. I think that's uh, maybe the critical question, in particular looking at this 10-year span towards 2030. How do we translate the insights from research into relevant policy? And I'll, I'll try to, uh, maybe not, Maybe it's, it's a good start to ask the right questions before answering the questions. And, and based, on the, based on the presentations, I think there are some interesting questions. And I think in the 2030 perspective, what would be the fuel mix that would bring us towards the, the ambition to reduce emissions by 50% in Norway? And uh, there's a number of insightful presentations on this. And I think if you look at the battery electric vehicles and plug-in uh, electric uh, um, 
vehicles with a 50% market share. Well, in 2025, the ambition is that we will have 100% zero emission vehicles. And in 2030, we even have to make sure that some of the combustion engines we have around uh, are running on zero emission fuels in the light duty vehicle seg segment. And um, I, I think several people pointed that, and, and Car in particular mentioned it very precisely, we don't have the policies in place to to support this transition. And I, I think there are in particular three areas that that uh, uh, we could point at, and one of them would be how could we sustain the increase in electrification in terms of battery electric vehicles? Uh, Lasse mentioned that the cost is more than 10,000 kroner per ton CO2 saved in terms of tax reliefs mostly. Well, Linda maybe gave us some hope that maybe it's not only financial um, uh, financial issues that will drive the decisions we could have norms and cultures as well. And, and this is going to be one of the major challenges for Norwegian policymakers, at least, how to transfer uh, away from pure economic stimuli to making sure this transition can happen in any case based on either regulation, where we penalize pollution much more heavily, or uh, making sure that we understand what drives the decisions for the buyers of these vehicles. If you look at the, the, the hydrogen biofuel discussion, it was very interesting to see the, the presentation of Cari again with, with uh, I think, a very clear picture showing that uh, if there is plenty of biofuels, let's go for biofuels to solve the 2030 challenges. Uh, if there is no uh, biofuels, uh, hydrogen pops up as an important part of the solution in the transport sector. And, um, and of course, when it comes to biofuels, I think the major issue is how sustainable would it be to burn these amounts of biomass in combustion engines in order to meet the short-term climate obligations. And, and for hydrogen, of course, if that's going to be part of the solution, we need to start building infrastructure more or less immediately. And I, I guess these are the challenges that politicians need to answer over the next few years to put in place regulation and incentives to, to achieve this. I think that would be the only way to actually be able to, to, to satisfy the, the constraint that we have imposed uh, by linking up to the EU climate policy with at least 40% emission reductions, maybe 50 to 55% emission reductions. And, and again, I would say that the links to industrial policy and, and the battery production uh, are highly interesting. When we did studies on the Norwegian transport sectors towards 2030, putting in this constraint of 50% emission reductions, we saw a welfare loss in, in, uh, in society of 45%. And this is a welfare loss that that would come unless you do structural changes to also create some value from the transition. If you only take the cost in the transition, it will lead to welfare losses in society. And, and then another challenge would be to link this transition policy up to industrial policy and look at how can you create additional value uh, for, from this transition. Maybe batteries would be part of that solution. Uh, as a final comment, I would like to say, I saw in the chat that um, Lasse commented on the EU ETS and, and too little mentioning of the EU ETS, and I, I would like to stress that as well, that every emission that we move away from a non-EU ETS, that is the emission trading system of Europe, like the emissions we take away from transport by, by cutting out fossil fuels and move into the EU ETS, EU ETS sector, for example, by starting using electricity either to produce batteries or to fill up the batteries of the electric vehicles, is good for environment. And, and the reason is that emissions in the electricity sector is capped by the EU ETS. So any additional demand will, of course, put pressure on, on, uh, on, uh, on the decarbonization of the, of the power sector. But the EU ETS will make sure that emissions do not increase, and it will indeed promote renewables. In, in this setting. So that's that's my comments, and um, I'm, I'm interested to hear what the, the speakers could bring to the table or questions from the audience. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, I will go back then to the question that came to you, Lasse Fridsum, earlier. 
I, re I repeat for all of us, is VAT on diesel fuel treated like VAT on any other commodity? I mean, do transport companies in no way get VAT spent on diesel fuel reimbursed from the government? Not to my knowledge. But I, I'm not sure if I really understand the question because, you know, in general, the input VAT is deductible. It's the output VAT that's payable to the government. So transport companies that buy diesel or any other input commodity deduct the VAT, the value-added tax on the input when they make their value-added tax account. I cannot see, unfortunately, who uh, sent that question. If you're still with us, you are um, welcome to uh, add additional question to Lasse Friedström if you were not happy with the, question, with the answer. And, uh, but going back to you again, uh, Lasse, you raised the question about EU emission trading systems. Yes. And did you get a, a response that you wanted now from Thomas Gar? Yes, he is correct. I think uh, I was I was a bit puzzled to see that in one of the bar graph, Estonia and Poland came out with a, uh, you know less of an advantage to battery electric vehicles than other countries. But in fact, since they are all under the same cap. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of energy mix there is in any particular country or in the European Union as a whole, for that matter. That's the beauty of the cap and trade system. Right. Yeah. Now, Anybody that like to comment on that? Add one small comment. Uh, since uh, last year, or maybe the year before, there is a market stability reserve in the European trading system, which means that the cap is no longer carved in stone. It actually could move a little bit up or down depending on uh, how many redundant allowances are, are canceled in the system. Yeah, so, but still the cap and trade system works wonderfully in that electrifying means moving emissions into the cap and trade system. Thank you. Um, Margaret uh, Wolfhard Mierens, um, I have a question for you. You know, might know that there are plans for um, battery production, a factory in Norway um, at the moment. And um, could you say how far we are in time from sustainable battery production? Uh. I think the first uh, first thing is that we get battery production in Europe. Also at, um, at the moment, we are completely re relying on um, batteries from uh, batteries from Asia, and I in in principle we are behind the schedule to make all these installations or and investments for. Um, a better a better a battery production I'd, and um, the first thing is to have a cost competitive battery production okay, i, I do not I, I didn't get uh, your question uh, completely for it seems i have some problems with my all right, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? So um, you um, you were asking about this um, Norwegian uh, battery uh, battery production. Yeah, and I wondered if you could tell us um, if we are very far away from a sustainable um, production of batteries in time. In um, in uh, in time, I think there are, uh, there is still room for imp uh, for improvement, but I don't think that uh, battery production um, in Europe or in Norway is um, 
um, is less, sustain, uh, less sustainable uh, compared to Asia. I, um, I think from, um, from, from the energy, uh, energy, mix, uh, energy mix, um, it should, uh, should, should be sustain, uh, should be sustainable, but of course there is still room for improvement, also for development, technology development, and also energy management. Okay, Over thanks very much. Time. Thank you very much. I've got another question here, and it actually is up for grab, um, but I wonder maybe Eisten Ulleberg, you could be the right person. How much and how does the energy supply of Europe need to change before the introduction of more electric vehicle causes a real reduction in emissions? I know I see it, Oscar Thomas Gar would like to answer. Please go ahead. Yes, yeah, so this is of course related to this discussion we had on the EU emission trading system, because as long as you move uh, away from fossil fuels, you immediately reduce the emissions in the transport sector. And then when you move that new demand for energy into the power sector, uh, since that is capped, uh, uh, the emissions doesn't increase. So in fact, all the emissions removed from the from the transport sector uh, are real emission reductions as uh, in, in the power sector, there are no new emissions coming in. So in fact, uh, you could keep uh, the power sector as it is today and, and all the emission reductions would be real still. Uh, in, uh, of, of course, what will happen during the next 20 years is that emissions will also go down in, in, the, in, in the power sector making the effect double in, in that respect that they will also be removed there. Thanks. Uh, Eisten Ulleberg, would you, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, but I would like just to remind uh, a point I was trying to make in my presentation and that is, um, you know, we are counting the terawatt hours and gigawatt hours, but there's also this issue of the capacity you know, so we need to in, install a lot of new capacity. If it's battery electric, we have a lot of components. If it's hydrogen electric, we have the hydrogen refueling stations and it's associated infrastructure and supply. So I think we need to have a, a, a holistic, it's correct in principle what Aska is saying, but I think uh, there are some practical challenges um, uh, here. Uh, and if you go in that group in the Yasak report was, for instance, a professor from Croatia. And, you know, it's very dramatic difference between their power system and our power system in Norway, just as an example. And so it's also about power quality, you know, the infrastructure. So it's not just some lines on a, on a, on a, on a PowerPoint on a table saying that, you know, if you do this switch, it, it, it's become, it becomes uh, challenging from on the ground, especially in some uh, countries. So you really have to refurbish uh, your uh, electrical infrastructure. And as a consequence, uh, as you can imagine, both economically and also environmentally. So we have to be careful when we design these new infrastructures. Thank you very much, Eisten Ulleberg. And to all of you that's been following us today, thanks so much for joining. And to the contributors, Thank you very much for your very valuable uh, contributions. Today we talked about light duty vehicles and the Academy hopes to invite you to a meeting on other part of this ESAC report later. And this is a part of the science advice from the Academy. It aims to give knowledge-based advice for policymakers. Goodbye for now. <laughs>